This is PodKit, episode 44, Maintainers at Advocate, on Sunday, January 6th, 2019. And now, that's what I get for not installing the keyboard. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk44. Guess what? What? It's been a long time since podcast again. How long? It has been. Um, about two months, right? Yeah, two months. A lot has happened since early November. Like what? Um, we had a U.S. election, a new U.S. Congress. Uh, I bought a MacBook Pro. Lots of CVEs. Uh, who knows how many? We sure don't. Uh, the stock market is all over the place. React 16. Point 6.3 and 16.7 are out. Brandon made 12 loaves of bread. It's 2019, and I shipped a beta at work. That's a lot of stuff. We've been busy. Very busy. Super busy. But now we're back for podcast. We'll see how many we get to this year. Yeah. Hopefully more than six. Uh, that's like every other month. That seems to be our cadence at this point. Yeah, that's not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we'll see we'll see what happens this year we will see we're off to it's not even a week in january yet so we're okay oh so 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 because, far so good and because we're not two months into the new year this is a good one yeah we have we have an average of one episode per week yeah, yeah this is now. like summer 2015 levels exactly yes, this is very good so i heard we had some uh follow-up is that true we sure did um, we were really uh, fortunate to have Dan Abramov from the React Core team uh, listen to our episode last month, um, and he provided some super awesome feedback um, and a lot of really cool resources about like the internals to React um, and a lot of the questions that we posed on that episode. Um, it was super, super awesome to hear from him um and to see some of those resources and to have a conversation about it because that it was really kind of interesting how our episode fit at a time when like a lot of other kind of discourse around that um happened and it's cool that he kind of gave us uh some really thoughtful responses there yeah we talked about some of the react internals he linked to um incremental reconciliation um and react fiber architecture um i think i've read a bit of both of those yep um uh, as we'll talk in a minute here um dan has been posting some more posts about how react kind of works as well so i've been reading those as well i just said as well a ton of times um yeah and he, he seemed pretty um responsive to the feedback and kind of reiterated why they announced react hooks the way they did yeah, totally. And like, I guess one thing that I feel like, you know, I personally didn't do a great job of is like describing um, or like kind of, uh, you know, gratitude for like just how or appreciation for just how like difficult a position it is to run a, uh, uh, a project like React, right? Like there's so, there's so much stuff, so many people pulling at you from so many different angles. Um and everybody's a critic for sure um but like it's really clear that like with a lot a lot of the ways that they've responded in the aftermath of hooks that they're really kind of like paying attention to this stuff and trying to improve as they go along um and that's been really awesome to see yeah and i'd say as a whole the uh recept or response to hooks is almost nothing but great as far as i can tell I don't mm-hmm. I don't see tons of talk about it much these days really. So yeah, I yeah. think it's um hooks are still in in an alpha state uh, at least according to the version that they get mm-hmm. pulled in from. I think there's still a lot of development that has to go on there. Um at least the dev tools work now, so that's good, right? Pretty um, awesome. And so we'll, we'll we'll talk a little bit later about some of the other work that we've done with hooks since November back back in november wow that was a long time ago and so i was just reading through some of those comments from dan and um one of the things that um he said is that we're stuck in this weird balance between share as early as possible this is open source and share only what's been proven to work 100 percent. and i think i think that that uh that idea is really interesting because 
you know, it's an open source project, but there might be pieces that, and I think, in, and of course we do this, like, so in theory, the our, our Nexus CMS is open source, but the next version of it isn't open source yet in the sense that it isn't in a public space yet. It will mm-hmm. be open source eventually. People can do whatever they want to it. But right now, it's just hidden because it just makes sense to have it that way. It's, yeah, it's too... It's going to change too much. Yeah, and too early. And you have to deal with documentation and support before it's really ready for it. Right. So I, I think there's there's it's an interesting thing. And then, then you compound that fact with um, just how visible uh, the React team is and how... Uh, you know how their correspondence with the community is. Well, speaking of Dan, uh, did you know that he has a new blog? Yeah, overreacted. I've been reading all the posts. They're what a what a good name, by the way. It's perfect. Yeah, that is a pretty awesome name. <laughs> so uh, this is Dan's new blog. Um, it is uh, written in Gatsby. Imagine that, right? Um, and so I don't remember when he started this first one. November thirtieth um, is when he did. Why okay. do we write super props? nice um and i i had been thinking that a lot of these were really fun because i i love learning about the internals of things like from a first-hand source because they actually know what they're talking about totally uh in particular the one that i really liked recently was from a couple weeks ago um things i don't know as of 2018 i think this is a really interesting post um because it it just reflects that while someone might be someone like Dan, I guess is might be known for certain things in the community. There are other things that he doesn't know anything about and that's okay. And that's normal. I I remember when I read this too, one of the things that was kind of um, that, that kind of stuck out to me was just like how this like um, cognizance of this stuff kind of conveys a, a, a sort of maturity that I think is often pretty absent from stuff like this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I remember, um, you know, when I was earlier on, I also didn't like to admit that like there were, I, I didn't like to admit areas where I didn't know enough, um, enough. or yeah, anything. Exactly. Yeah. Right. right, right. Yep. Um, and a lot of that's because like, I think especially in college and in a lot of employment situations too, there are a lot of places where like, um, you know, you have to, you almost always are dealing with situations where you don't know, um, enough to, to get by. Right. And you have to kind of make decisions to, um, to do the best with what information you do have or what knowledge you do have or what skills you do have. But I think like having that cognizance can help you make better decisions in that situation. And I think, you know, a, uh, I think Dan's post was a really interesting touch point for like, um, a, it says a lot about Dan, and B, it says a lot about like it, it says a lot about how he likes to interact with the community too. I feel like, right? Oh, for sure, he's willing to be vulnerable and honest here for this, exactly, which I find great. That's wonderful. Yeah, definitely. And like, I I guess like a thing that has kind of been on my mind recently too is like how maintainers have kind of put on this like developer advocate kind of hat um, in a lot of ways. So like, you know. I think, and Dan seems like one of those people that's kind of pushing that definition forward a little bit, um, which is which is pretty awesome. I don't, I you know, as far as I know, I don't think he views himself as having like that title for sure. But I think there's definitely a, a component where like that is um, component. That's like part of the work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maintainer did advocate. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think I think he might be starting to see himself um, a little bit more as that because he is writing this blog, and I think there's there's a lot of value in that um, that kind of role. Um, and you know, like Sean Larkin is kind of in that role for Webpack too. I mean, there's there's a lot of people in that role for various projects and right. you know sub communities. Um, so in this particular post, I I tried to come up, like I tried to figure out like what did he like. How did he pick these things to say that he didn't know about them? I take this as, um, you know, common things that you would see on a resume or what's hot right now. He mentioned, you know, containers, serverless, microservices. Are those popular these days? Sorry, I work in enterprise. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. They're all the they're all the the talk. I mean, I I see I see a lot of talk around those areas. Um, you know, at work, I see a lot of uh, about data science and Python. 
some node. Brandon's always talking about React Native and Objective C. Um, you know, in the more web web community, you see a lot more about um, CSS and new frameworks and ways of handling that. And then um, I don't know GraphQL, just like kind of the the big hot things right now and experience you might get when you're working on um, an application on like a product team somewhere. Um, and I think this is kind of, I feel like if, you know, because Dan is on a React core team, he's getting experience in different types of JavaScript development. And it's Absolutely. when you're not implementing applications day in and day out, you deal with a lot less variety of tools and frameworks, I believe. I've got to make a pun on that. It's Dan in, Dan out. Oh, man. <laughs> I okay. see you did there. Go on. I guess another thing that I thought of here is like, um, you know, maybe less like listing the technologies that are that are commonly on like resumes and maybe more like anytime you run into something um, and you're kind of like, I don't really want to deal with that right now. <laughs> um, so if, like for me, I a lot of these particularly stuff like, yeah, I, like I feel like for me, I would probably be a little bit more um, specific about some of these areas where I feel like I maybe don't know as much as I would like to. Like um, Unix commands in Bash, I'm pretty familiar with because I had like a, a kind of opsy role at the U for a while. Um, but like, I totally agree that like I don't know how to use xargs. Every time I do, I have to look it up. There are a lot of other yeah. commands like that that every time I do, I have to look it up. Yep. Um, low level languages. I I did some work in low level languages for a while. I don't do it as much anymore. But you know, well, the further there's... away I get from the U, the further away I get from that. <laughs> and I think and I think you point out a great thing about this. Like so. And and so I think Dan admits here, like, so yeah. I don't know about I, he knows about these things because he wrote oh, them totally. down, but he exactly. doesn't know. He's not confident to say that he knows how to use them or about them, like in detail. So I think there's an interesting thing for for us in the community to think about is what is our threshold for knowing something. So I like as a consultant, one of my like. For me, I think of my job as knowing about things and then helping clients use the things that I know about to make whatever they're working on better. So I might not know how to do something or a lot of detail about it, but I might just know about something broadly enough to to help them along with it. Um, and so, and so when I when I thought about this list, I thought making this kind of list cold, like if I just sat down and tried to think about the things that I don't know about, all I could think about were the things I knew about. So it's really, I thought it was really hard to come up with this kind of a list. Totally, and like I guess another thing that stuck out to me as I was reading this is it actually reminded me a little bit of like a thing I did for my React Native talk at React Minneapolis a while back, where like. Um, basically i had this giant disclaimer that like i'm not a java developer i'm not a swift or objective c developer i can write the code but um you know that that sort of thing is like you know like i i and like i guess another thing you know kind of as somebody who's also a consultant um i would i kind of would judge a lot of this stuff by like whether or not i would accept the project in it cold right and like i probably wouldn't except most you know android app like native android app projects cold i actually just turned one down recently right um and i probably wouldn't accept most objective c or swift app only native apps um for that same reason just because i don't feel like um that would be it wouldn't be fair kind of a wheelhouse project and, yeah but and, and on the same hand it's also really hard to break into some new tech if you're not willing to do some of that. So it's always a hard totally. balance. Um, and, and like, like Brian said, like if you're working in sort of the library side, the framework side of a, of a product or system, you don't get exposed to um, some of those, you know, other technologies that are used to deploy or to do whatever. Um, and a lot of my knowledge is because I wanted to do stuff on my own before I even started working. So I had to learn enough about pieces of things to be right. able to do stuff all by myself. I feel like um, for for Dan in particular, at least my observation of it, um, these yes, these are things he doesn't know, but it doesn't you know highlight what he thinks he's he's excel he's he's good at. And I think you know exactly. library design is, 
I think the bulk majority of JavaScript developers don't just write library, uh, one library or parts of a library day in and day out. And so that's a, that's a pretty big unique feature or of not feature, but a um, set of skills that there's a place for. And I mean, Dan's in that place. So that's yep, good. I agree. And ar- arguably one of the most accomplished um, people in, in, in JavaScript, right? In that, in that way. He's, he's definitely, I think the most social of the, the core team. Yep. Um, Sophie's, Sophie's pretty good. She's on Twitter very, very much as well. Um, do I, do I follow Sebastian? I hope I do. Yeah. So, he, he was a Twitter followee early on. Yeah. <laughs> follow everybody, he's right? He's been on this podcast before. So I, what I think would be interesting is, you know, it's a good thing this is the first week of January. So I think what would be interesting is throughout the year, and as Brandon said, when you come across something that you think you don't want to do right now because you don't know it well enough, or you you come across a, a detail of a thing you do know, but you don't know that detail very well. Uh, so like you can make it apps, but you don't know Java very well, so you would kind of say, no, let's not do that right now. Um, you know, as, as um, you know, for us... It'd be cool to make a list, you know, in the middle of the year and at the end of the year of the things that we collected throughout the year, because I just think that's really interesting. But also just just even if you're a listener, you should do the same thing, because I think it's really interesting to have that list of things that I don't know, like it doesn't even have to be about things you don't know. It can also be the things that you do know. So like I learned tons of stuff this year or I guess 2018 um, about how using docker images containers docker compose and and how kubernetes fits in together with that like i learned so much about that last year um and like there's a ton of stuff that i didn't even know that i didn't know but i know that i don't know now well that was a hard thing to say (laughs) it's you know you have the you've never really heard of it don't know it and then the i've looked at it a little bit and i really don't know it kind of a well and then there's the there's the uh i didn't know that any of this existed before I learned this one little piece, and now right. what do I do? Yeah, this is worse now. Is it's like the um, uh, who's that like uh, popular, like popular science dude? Is it Malcolm Gladwell? Like the known knowns, the known yeah. unknowns, the unknown knowns, and exactly. the unknown unknowns. Yep. Yeah, I feel like that's a Gladwell thing. I could be wrong, but I totally agree with you. Yeah, and I think I actually already have a note started with some of this stuff, and like. Uh, first on the list to be honest it's it's like uh web graphics and canvas mm-hmm. um and like that's the thing that i you know i guess i kind of noted it because i want to dive into it more this year but yeah for sure yeah i just think that's really interesting so you know like make a make a google drive doc and when you come across something you don't know just put it in there and then you know just be okay with it it's fine you don't have to know everything now i will say um sarah dressner uh, replied back to the to Dan on, on Twitter saying, I just got so sad realizing I couldn't ever write a post like this because people always assume I know nothing and it's only after proving myself over and over that they start to believe me. But even then, they don't always. Sorry to be depressing. So I think it takes... You need to be in a certain place to be able to put out a post like this and have the community respond in positive ways. Well, to be fair, on Hacker News and on subreddit, web dev, whatever... Dan's posts were often ridiculed as um, basically making him in the future unemployable because he's now admitted that he knows nothing, apparently. And I don't know, like, I read I read that from those people and it's like, yeah, OK, good luck with that. Well, right. And it's like um, some of the best advice I'd ever heard was like, uh, you know, there sometimes, you know, if uh if you apply somewhere and there there's like a list of metrics that like if if somebody doesn't want to employ you because x y or z then you probably didn't want to be employed with them in the first place like i think this is one of them if if somebody's reason for not employing dan is because he wrote a post about all of his all of the things that he's not familiar with or doesn't doesn't know to the degree he he has other skills and not only that and maybe he wouldn't apply to those jobs or take those roles if he didn't feel confident in those in I those positions. Not. Or he would say, well, do I get ramp up time? Like, I don't know. Like, exactly. When I, I do a lot of interviews with a lot of people, 
and I, I'm okay. I, in fact, I interviewed two people, a senior dev and a junior dev, and basically it was a you know interviews for be, be forming a new team, and the senior dev just pretended to know what I was talking about and had no idea how to actually answer, and the junior dev said, "Yeah, I don't know it, but I would love to learn it," and I'm like, "Cool." That was way more helpful. Like, just telling me you don't know is way better. Like, I think another point to what Sarah's saying, too, is that there's definitely a gendered aspect to this, where Sarah's had to kind of, as she said in her own words, like, um, continuously pr- prove herself. And, like, as a result, she doesn't feel comfortable, like, enumerating those same things. Um, you know, and it's it's easy to tell that, like, as a community, we're not really mature in a way that kind of expects that kind of vulnerability but hopefully folks like dan can help bring some of that maturity because that would be like people should be able to to do stuff like that to share that kind of kind of introspection well hey uh keeping it rolling with react uh ryan what do you think about uh about hooks i know you've been doing some stuff with hooks and grid and some other fun things yes i have been doing that uh so uh Basically, uh, between the last time we recorded and this time we recorded, um, I had some kind of uh, what what is approaching free time at work. So, like, I didn't have any new projects to do, and I only had to do maintenance on old projects. So that was kind of cool. And so with that maintenance time that I had, I decided to try hooks in some existing code. So, like, what's the process for converting something that's already class-based into something that's more hook-like? Um, and so with those, with, with those projects that I did this to, um, I had already been using context, um, for, uh, state management, like at the app level. So no, no redux. Um, but we can talk about that too, of course. Um, there's, you know, hooks are really nice. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go back to classes ever again. I like to Um, hear it. Yeah. It's really, (laughs) it's really weird. Um, so like there there are some organizational things that I I find odd about hooks a little bit, um, and it's probably because I'm not sure how to use the custom hook approach very well right now. So for example, one of the cool benefits of having a class is that you can have your render function, and you might have some at the top of your render function. You might have some derived properties. So like here's the list, and then transform that list with map into some other list format, and then render it out somehow well okay so then that's how it could be in the hook as well but now you've got sort of like all of your logic in one function and so like now your function starts to get really big and you're sort of mixing concerns but with classes you could have a function just be like map data like that could just be the function or you know whatever so there's there's sort of some there's a loss of specificity with what goes on inside of that rendering function now because it's the hook thing the component is all one function now um so like overall like it's really good they're simple to use the 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 way that it interacts with context is wonderful and i can't believe that there isn't backwards support you know backwards compatibility support for the same kind of thing in in classes because accessing context without this now is too painful to even believe um yeah hooks good very good like them i still haven't really used them other than a few code pens here and there but it looks super promising i'm excited i still use redux full and full full out at work so i don't think i'll really be using hooks for a long time other than you know for simple components to replace a simple state i don't i don't know yet how redux interacts with hooks because uh apparently there isn't like used redux or something right. i'm sure there will be right i'm sure there is there is actually one but it's not from the same repo it's from somebody else and i didn't want to try it yet i i'm sure it'll be a, a, almost identical in in function to use context like it'll be basically use store import store do whatever you do it, it it'll be totally fine and actually the way i modeled my context store usage is that i get a state and a dispatch so it, it should all be roughly similar almost identical api wise yeah, it's um it's kind of weird like when you when you try using some of those hooks and then you um go back to something with classes you're like, "Hmm, this is kind of messy." 
Yeah, <laughs> I could see that. I definitely haven't really been using hooks as much as I had hoped to. Um, still over in React Native land where I think we only got a React Native build that could target or that could use the um, the version of React that um, supports hooks like a couple weeks ago, like early mid December or something like that. And um, yeah, just haven't haven't looked at it yet. But I'm hoping to um, use. So I just upgraded a little side project app that I do. Um, using Expo to the latest version of the Expo nice. SDK. 32. And yeah, so I'm hoping that might allow that to work, but I'd have to manually try and mess with it. I'm sure, you know, um, Evan Bacon or one of the uh, Expo folks have, have figured out a way to do that, and I just haven't looked at it yet. But yeah, I would, I would love, to to, so. love, love to talk to you more about Expo because I, I'm an Expo fan as well. Um I wanted to mention one other thing that's fun about hooks now is that um, DevTools works now. So when I tried hooks back in November for our previous episode, uh, hooks did not work with DevTools at all. So if you tried to open React DevTools, the DevTools would just stop and say, nope, you can't do that. Um, so one of the cool things you could do before is you could see, like, if you had some state, like, f- first name, last name you could see first name and last name. And as you typed into the input box, you could see in dev tools that being reflected, like you could just see it. But now with hooks, if you're using use state for each individual input field, you don't get to see that. And it's kind of weird. That is pretty weird. So like you could get around it by having all of your, um, all of your actual values get passed to a child component. Um, by name prop so and then also pass down the the setters uh the 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 probably real way around it is that if you have complex state so in other words more than one state you use use reducer um and then use reducer puts everything into an object and then you can see the single state as an object inside of the dev tools i don't know it's kind of a mess right now and I think that may be the one outstanding strangeness with hooks that you can't see the state of a component the way you could before. I feel like the way around that could also be each hook would hook into dev tools to show their their value that they're they're managing. It yeah, does but sound how do like you, some... how do you know what the hook is? Like how do you know the first hook is username or first name or last name? Well, every every hook would have to implement you know, if dev and dev tools is the thing, do this. Yep. But right, but but the hooks aren't bound to a name, and that's the problem. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're just arbitrary. They're just things. They're just they're just numeric indexes that incidentally all line up. And you, as a programmer, or you as a JavaScript programmer, I guess I should say, happen to use the same variable in the same way every time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of weird, um, and I think that, I feel like that might be the one outstanding oddness. Well, hey, do you want to um, detour real quick into Expo? I would, I if you want, more Expo things. If, if you want to, go for it. Um, so one of the one of the best things that I discovered about Expo is I was kind of reigniting that um, that side project app was. Um, a, I discovered recently that I was running Expo SDK 25, which is from like a long time ago. Yep, that um, is a while ago, right? Right. And uh, they actually just removed support for Expo SDK version 25 from the actual Expo client. So I discovered recently that I couldn't actually even launch the app because the support for that SDK was literally gone, um, which was hilarious. Um, but then, you know, I kind of put that off for a little while because I was like, well, um, I don't really want to deal with, um, upgrading React Native because upgrading React Native is like, um, painful. It's awful. It's horrendous and it's bad. And, and, um, there's not a good, a good timely way to do it. But then I remembered, um, a lot of that has to do with the native project. Um, and because this is a regular old unejected expo app, I should just be able to, um, update some package versions, yep. uh, reinstall, and, and go. So you I have tried to wipe to node modules up. four times. Right. 
of course <laughs> that's i mean that's a given but yeah. uh yeah i actually i have a react native alias there an alias a shell alias that i use to reset a react native app that basically does exactly what you said nice remove removes all node modules um clears the cache removes node modules again because why not why and not then reinstalls yep. clears the package or cache and kicks everything over yep. um anyhow so i i upgraded it from like version 25 to version 26 and it still didn't work um and i was like kind of puzzled at why that was and then i realized um i should i should um try the approach of uh, patron saint of, of javascript ken ken wheeler uh javascript in all things american apparently um and uh and just upgrade straight from version 20, 25 to version 31. Mm-hmm. And uh, sure enough, when I did that, it worked perfectly. Nice. <laughs> and I only had to uninstall and reinstall new modules once. <laughs> that does fix everything. Yeah, it really I, does. St. Kenneth of Wheeler heard my prayer and um, <laughs> smiled, smiled upon me that day. Um, and I, yes, I, I poured um, out an entire bottle of whiskey uh, <laughs> in, in gratitude um and 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 th- threw a prime rib at uh i don't know somebody passersby <laughs> yeah we've we've had our own fair share of strange expo upgrades but usually they go pretty well that's awesome uh so you are you are using expo then for yeah so for, we for real yeah so for our uh our chicken farming application at work Aha. Uh, which is a public product in the play store which is why i can talk about it um nice we used expo for it and it it works pretty well um you know there's some there's some weird things and there's some limitations here and there but you know for the most part the upgrades are fine um right now we're we're holding off on upgrading from 30 to 30 whatever the latest is it's either 31 or 32 i thought for sure 32 just came out um the reason we're holding off is that because our customers in brazil where the chickens are um are running some old versions of android and they will be Uh dropped in the next version so right. we're trying to buy them a little bit more time before we take it away from them. Right, right. But really, to be honest, nobody should be running Android 4.4. So Exactly. Maybe instead of buying them time, you should buy them uh, <laughs> some, some new cheap Android devices. No, yeah, you're right. You're right. I think that might be the actual thing that we have to end up doing. Didn't. No, that's yeah. awesome. I, I remember you all were using Expo to, to prototype that, but I couldn't remember whether it was actually shipped with... Uh, yeah expo. yeah it, it sure was and um you know none of none of us know objective c swift mm-hmm. or uh, well, although i guess we all know java technically because it's prototypical right. language i mean it's pseudocode that's what i mean um right. so i i don't know like if we hadn't had react native with expo we would have had uh, probably double our time and we would have we would have had a worse thing to ship at the end totally yeah I'm really excited. One of my uh, one of my goals for 2019 is to ship this um, this prototype or this uh, this project that I've been working on for essentially six months right now. This this little um, sketch that I've been working on basically since May. Um, I've only put like two total hours into it nice. <laughs> in that six months, um, but I have to move it away from Airtable and uh, make the UI an actual yep. UI and make it multi-tenant so people can log in and yeah. maybe add in at purchases or maybe not who knows um but once i get that to work that'd be pretty cool and it's good to hear that um you all were able to kind of ship it with expo because um i'm i'm a pretty big fan of the tooling oh yeah i mean you know our our app is is uh i mean it's being used by hundreds of clients now hundreds of customers and you know the the servers you know just a uh, lasty bean stock stuff and you know node and it's all pretty pretty routine um you know if you I, I of course i would recommend now having done all that like if you can use graphql and you need server-side stuff like oh, yeah. use GraphQL. i'm definitely gonna use prisma for sure 100 percent. yeah because it it just makes everything so much easier we had to we had when we you know we prototyped everything with a really strict restful style uh every resource was returning a single object no no tree but turns out 500 objects yep. later I that's 500 you. requests and that's bad yep really bad awful so graphql tell it tell the server what you want and it'll give it to you it's pretty perfect i'm i'm kind of excited for that because like um a lot of the ui in this little project i have is like kind of was essentially kind of the way it is because of how i had to request the data um which is fine like 
but i i want to right it, it is also annoying and i want to be able to like also annoying um rely on apollo clients awesomeness to like you know cache and and, and have data at the ready that i've already fetched yada 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 i just wrote down two things i don't know apollo and prisma don't worry i know about them but i just don't know anything about them see apollo like there's a difference the greek god of um <laughs> uh war i think no that's definitely wrong but uh and he also likes to run fast those are those are the only two things i know about apollo and both of them are wrong apollo is the space program and Pris- prisma is a, is a typo of the oh. word prism there you go <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah uh apollo the god of music poetry arts oracles archery herds and flocks diseases healing lights on knowledge and protecting or protection of the young literally of everything i guess yeah well that's the thing about those uh greek gods is that uh everybody's one of them <laughs> i guess so so i hear um well that's cool um let's see what else do we want to talk about um uh, i think you're talking about uh new year resolutions <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess one one of mine is uh, to ship that out. Um, my other New Year's resolution is 4K. Um, Brian, what's yours? Nice. Uh, my new resolution is 2560 by 1600, but that's running 1440 by 900 at one point. Whatever. I bought a new 13-inch MacBook Pro, and that's what I'm running on now. There you and go. And it's plugged into a 1080p monitor. That's awesome. So whatever that is, that's my resolution. So I am sitting here in the new studio with two 1080p panels and then in the middle, a 4K panel. But the sad news is that (laughs) my computer, I mean, it has a 970 in it, but it doesn't really like to run it at actually 4K. (laughs) Right. So I have it toned down to whatever 2K is. Okay. There you go. Nice. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty funny. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I don't really have any resolutions same all good I see if you want... make it if you make it a hard goal you're not going to hit it right. so you have to like just make passive small little life uh pattern changes or small life lifestyle changes right all right well you know no matter what i hear it has to be s- smart um seismic materialistic uh authentic uh um uh i don't know what a, a <laughs> word that starts with R realistic is. realistic no, no that's that's way too legitimate it has to be more <laughs> like uh like Ra- <laughs> random yeah random there we go and uh t uh t stands for totally ridiculous yeah oh, okay. um, smart sm- <laughs> that's smart with like the tumblr or old twitter style tentative snowy. exactly yeah tentative <laughs> there you go. that's the real that's the real one um no but i guess like for me the biggest wow are... brandon just tabbed off the document what did you do yeah what happened? Work? what happened what happened did i do he hit tab only the did. cursor just kept going off the document this is google docs by the way everyone oh no um, it, well bugs you know uh that's what i get for not installing the keyboard drivers oh my gosh <laughs> that was fun <laughs> I heard you gave a talk, Brandon. I did. It was it was interesting. Brian was there. Thanks for being there, Brian. That was fun. It was a good talk. I I I uh I went from knowing nothing about React Native to some things about React Native. Hey, there you go. That that was another title. That was an alternative title of my talk. Uh, uh React Native, some things about it. Um, <laughs> and you know, basically that is kind of how I presented it. It was just like a bucket of things that I had learned um from building react native apps and more particularly building native modules for react native apps had a lot of live coding which was a mistake um but the slides are pretty solid because they talk about a lot of the um a lot of the pitfalls and a lot of like one of the things i really wanted to convey was um just how when you build a react native app you will probably find yourself needing to make the decision as to whether or not you want to use a native module or a javascript module and that distinction is not entirely clear um, just through the documentation, and it's not entirely clear just if you look at the readmes for some of these modules. And like, kind of one of the big examples I gave was Google Analytics. There's a pure JavaScript Google Analytics package, but it's made for the browser, and it won't give you the metrics you want if you try to use it in a React Native app. You're going to want the native. True. You're going to want the native Google Google Analytics SDK. Otherwise, you're going to be sad. And um, you know, there are a bunch of other things like that. Hilariously, there's like um, 
I read an example recently where somebody said you should use the pure JavaScript Firebase SDK and not the mobile app SDK in a React Native app. And I was like, what? <laughs> That's just dumb. And then somebody was like, but even Google recommends it. And I'm like, nope. Well, ugh. you know, it's like the rage quit. I hate everything. What, why do we try to make this stuff work? <laughs> it's the um, Grandpa Simpson gif where exactly. he walks in the door turns around and closes the door yep exactly yep that that is that is yeah so like this the slides are up i have a recording of it that was kind of um you know uh for lack of a better phrase a little bit bootleggy because i just opened up uh quick time two quick time instances one to record my screen one to record my voice and i mostly talked into the laptop so it probably works it even caught all of my awful live coding um but uh, it, it was a good talk. Got some good feedback. And um, yeah, it was, it was pretty fun. Thanks to the folks at React Minneapolis for having me. It's always a good time. I like I like the last picture in the slide. Yeah, I didn't. With your with, with your buddy who has a matching shirt. I, I didn't uh, show that, but that is, um, that's Nathan who helps to run the React Minneapolis meetup. Um, that's so good. <laughs> yeah, this is like four years ago at JSMN. <laughs> and we were like, why are we both wearing the same shirt? And it's like, because Target. Because... He actually, okay. <laughs> he actually works at Target now, which makes it all the more oh, hilarious. That is good. Um, so there you go. Well, you know what they say, you look better in red. Yeah, red, red <sighs> and khakis, that's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah I gave a talk um, at uh, JavaScript Minnesota, yeah. um, I don't know, seven months ago about React Native and what we learned from our project. Exactly. Um, in six months. And I have had, I don't know, maybe two or three people email me because of that video asking me questions about react and expo and i thought so i always think that's funny like i know anything no it's it's awesome and you're totally right like i think that's kind of one of the reasons why i want to post that video not so much because i expect people to sit there and watch me for an hour and 10 minutes yeah um which oh my god that was an hour and 10 minute talk why did i do that ah I think it's important to have some more stuff out there especially as i'm independent it's like oh, when i absolutely. give a talk i should just have I should just have indications where people know what I am like and yep. can page through stuff like that. So I also, I did apply to speak at open source North. Cool. Um, so we'll see Ooh. how that works. Yeah. It's they keep happen. sending me emails for speaker positions and I keep closing yeah, the email. I, I keep hoping that what that means is not that they immediately rejected my uh, speaking thing. <laughs> and it's instead that they just want more and more people to do it, which gives me a higher chance of maybe possibly being accepted. Cause that'd be fun. I hope so. I mean, it's a it's a it's a really cool cool little little conference, which is what I like about it. Yeah, it's it's pretty remarkably well run for um, how new and how kind of uh, uh, small small ish. Well, so are they going to get, go into their fourth or fifth year this time? I think this is like their fifth year. Yeah, you're yeah, right. It's pretty good. I'm hoping I can go. I think Seat Robinson is a platinum sponsor this year. So nice. exactly, very so good. good. Nothing to top the way to go way to go i think we've had 30 people go last year from that's amazing company, so yeah we um at doherty we, we we have uh like a group of incoming college kids come, you know starting working soon yeah and i would love to have that group of of you know new new hires go to this um because it's it's a great first conference yeah totally definitely it's local it's not too big it's all in one day um, it's centrally located for sure it's literally i mean can you get better <laughs> for than some for some definition of centrally located well for yeah for, for, well, for, for those who own cars well, uh, that's true. and also for the people that work at doherty that's also yeah. true <laughs> uh i don't know if you can get any more centrally located than literally in normandale college yeah i mean i'm i'm a northeast metro person so i'm like come on that's literally on the other side of the universe from everything i know and love i think you would prefer it to be there than woodbury i i don't know okay the woodbury woodbury's woodbury's uh you know i could i could steal a car from my family for for a moment and and get to woodbury but <laughs> normandale they're like how do i how do i know you're even going to make it back from normandale it's like six hours away oh my gosh <laughs> no. I know. But I guess the other thing I'll say about um, Open Source North is, I, I guess I said it was like kind of a small conference. I don't know that it really is a small conference, but I think it's small in comparison to other conferences that are trying to do what it is trying to do. When I think about no uh, Open Source North and then I think about Midwest JS, 
Yeah. Like I feel like Midwest JS is trying to be a big main name conference. Yep. But I don't I don't necessarily think that it is. Right. And then Open Source North is I think they had when I went one year, I think they had four four options per slot and you'd pick one. And that's pretty big, but it for some reason it just felt smaller than um Midwest JS. Yeah, I, I guess like I think that's a good way to put it, or a good comparison, because like I feel like Open Source North is very much a um, a conference that is run professionally, like a like a big conference. Yeah. Um, and you know, which is why you have four options per time slot, for example. And I, I feel like that that part is pretty awesome. Um, I actually have never been to Midwest JS, which is hilarious and strange. Um, but that's uh that's a story for another day it is a story um, for another yeah, day it's i'd like I, to get there sometime i can tell you some stories out in the fringe if you want Ooh. yeah for sure <laughs> hey everyone listen to the fringe well i guess i have one other thing unless anyone wants to talk about anything else uh i finally put https on my uh amazon s3 hosted websites so you can now see a little little lock icon when you go to my uh website it's kind nice. of fun Ooh, look at uh, that that's an achievement yeah, and uh, I did it by sending uh, Amazon like three to five more cents per month. <laughs> um, so basically what I've done now, so the, the the biggest problem, right, was that I was using S3 website hosting, yep. which is fine because, um, you know, S3 on its own, it d- does a pretty good job of delivering resources to people, right? Um, and I, I like that a lot, and it was relatively cheap, and I could upload things pretty easily, and I even have like a little script that generates a upload script based on the um based on the name of the, the project and stuff like that so I, I can pretty automatically have things uploaded um when i create a new project which is which is pretty awesome um the problem with it though is um amazon won't by default um have a, an HTTPS cert generated for any domains that you're using to host your s3 websites in order to do that, you have to create a CloudFront distribution, which is fine, but it's also kind of annoying because I don't really want to, like, why does my personal website need a CDN? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's going to be, like, maybe five people who are going to access it at once, like, at most, and that's, like, when I'm speaking at a conference and put it up for five minutes so that people can even type down the URL. You know what I mean? Um, but... Um, it hasn't been very much more expensive and it was relatively easy to get AWS to generate that cert, associate it to the CloudFront distribution, associate the distribution to that S3 bucket, and that was kind of the end of it. Because all that was in-house with AWS, it was pretty pretty inexpensive and relatively easy to, to manage. Um, that said, I don't really like giving Amazon more money. <laughs> and uh, that part's kind of annoying, so who knows, maybe I'll switch to something else at some point and then wait for a year and then add HTTPS after the fact as I did with Amazon. Hey, yeah. GitHub Pages we'll does HTTPS now for custom domains. Nice. It's pretty good. Yeah. That's true, but then I always have to have the code for my personal site publicly available, which is fine and I think I do, but like I mean it is anyway, right? Like ki- kind of, it's all built though. Right. True. I I I feel your pain, Brandon. Um I I, I don't I also refuse to give Amazon money in for my own personal websites because I feel like I I can do better than that. Um and so instead what I do is I lose the Let's Encrypt lottery every month or three months or whatever it is. Right. And and so suddenly contextual dot link doesn't work again because oh look, it expired and yeah. It works right now, oh, but you. but every every ninety days, like the lottery is lost. Oh no! Uh, yeah, it happens. I getcha. Sometimes, like seven dollars a year isn't too bad. Yeah, you yeah. Just get I don't a whole know. cert yourself. I, I, I'm okay with it. I, I, I will live with it. It's... All right. Well, I think we're at the uh, time for new Twitter followies. Uh, everybody's Seems favorite section. Way. Brendan, want to kick us off? Yeah. So I only followed like five hundred people in the last <laughs> three months. Um, so I've got just a couple to share with you. So let's, let's, can you get that down to three? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, so the first one is, uh, 
join interact which is the interact fellowship which a bunch of people were tweeting about um it seems kind of cool it's this thing where like uh for for two years you kind of get placed in this cohort of people ages 18 to uh 24 who are trying to build kind of um you know initiatives with like um kind of uh, socially forward sort of objectives sounds kind of cool somebody mentioned it so i put it in there and who knows what will come of that um i've been like messaging it to a bunch of people who are kind of in that same uh age group because i think there are a lot of people kind of in our in our age group uh who kind of have that kind of interest or that thirst to work on something that's a little bit um maybe less commercial in nature definitely more social in nature yep um and you know usually the number one response i get back from people about that is like wait actually what is this i don't know what it is and I'm, and my second response is always it's backed by a bunch of vc frames so it's kind of maybe bad i don't know we'll see <laughs> uh so i don't know it'll be interesting to see what comes of that if anyone in town gets it that would be cool um i might apply for it who knows we'll see um but now i've just said it's bad on the internet so it might be bad who knows <laughs> you never know uh that might hurt my chances or make for an entertaining story well, um, as we've other, seen, yeah. if you admit something, it's better. Yeah, exactly. We'll see. We'll see. Um, the next thing was Christmas XP, which is all about um, like uh, WebGL programming. That was an advent calendar at the end of 2018. Um, so it's pr- maybe not worth following right now, but it's a great thing to look back at because it's a lot of really interesting stuff in there. Um, I think Sarah Dreisner, who taught the... Um, uh, who, who taught the um, uh, SVG animation workshop I went to at Front End Masters a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Um, she mentioned this. A bunch of other people are in it. It's really kind of a cool thing. Um, and then last but not least is Chris Coyer, who is uh, one of the people behind uh, CodePen and CSS Tricks. Um, if you've ever wanted to learn anything about Flexbox or Grid, you've probably used CSS Tricks. Um, so that's that's why um, I gave Chris a shout out. I don't know why I haven't been following him because I'm pretty sure I have been following him. Yeah, that is interesting. But... Um, I will uh, double plug uh, Chris, but also and more importantly CSS Tricks because they had a recent redesign and wow, is it amazing! And it's I don't, beautiful. Like they redesign their website basically every year to show off like how well they know CSS Tricks, which is ironic because right. it's called CSS Tricks. Um, but wow, just like what an amazing redesign and it is beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. They did a really good job for sure. Yep. How about you, Brian? Um, I followed a few people. Um, let's start with, uh, Jesse Frizzell. Uh, um, I saw somewhere early in the show notes. I don't know if this is mentioned. Um, someone put out a list of top people to follow on Twitter in tech. Or people, or not, maybe not Twitter, but people to follow. She was on there. Dan Abramov was on there. Sarah Dressner was on there. Uh, yeah, Jesse is pretty awesome. Um, she has a. Hey, I think she is a, a big proponent and or user of the lap rack, which we discussed in the fringe. Um, and like, I, I think she's kind of graduated since then onto like actual server racks because uh, she can do that. But um, she also has a lot of really interesting stuff on the internet around like uh, home networking or her home networking setup and i think she has like a kubernetes cluster of like um intel next units of computing um like yeah definitely an iconic awesome person to follow on twitter absolutely um next um a little more local is uh eugene belinsky he uh i think i've talked to him once or twice or at least he gave a talk at javascript minnesota or somewhere um He wrote, uh, shoot, what was that app called? I'll link it in the show notes as well. Um, type style for fun Unicode formatting of of text that you want to write. Um, totally. Yeah. He wrote that. Follow him on Twitter. You should follow him too. Eugene is so cool. I think he actually ended up, um, you know, kind of funny story. Um, I ran into him at um, Open Source North a while back, and it turned out he actually was going to move into a building that I had lived in. <laughs> which is hilarious because i just moved out at the same time as essentially he was moving in so that's fun he's a good kid awesome awesome human he's actually older than me so it's just me continuing the the uh yeah you uh, um 
you were talking about um, Join Interact. I saw on their application form, you have to be 18 and 23. And I think all of us are here. I don't know. I'm 24. I'm almost 25. So I'm 23 for another six months. I'm so you old. You young and you. All right. Uh, next up is Katie Hemp- Hempenius. Uh, she's a software engineer at Google. So I see some cool stuff around the Google and JavaScript area or Chrome area. I think, I don't know. I've saw tweets of hers retweeted. So I'm like, follow. Uh, and next up is, uh, I don't know her name. JBD Christmas tree is her, her name or rack rack. Cool. R A K Y L L. Um, another person at Google, some cool tweets. I don't know. I'm following people. See, I feel like half the time I mention people on new Twitter followees within three or three to six months, I unfollow half of the new people. Cause I'm like, <laughs> I follow too many people. It's, I got to cut it back. But these are people, if you can follow more people on Twitter, you should all follow them. Got it. It's, it's okay. Um, all I'll say about that is my philosophy about following people on Twitter is that follows are, are cheap and you can follow you can follow as many people as you like and it'll be probably okay maybe possibly tweets are ephemeral and just like i don't expect everybody to see every one of my tweets um i'd have to imagine other people are okay with me not seeing every one of their tweets i don't know whether that's true or not though i guess now that i say that i um, <laughs> but it's all good i follow the same philosophy although i just don't follow anybody either um i i often just skip to the top of the timeline and then read back as far as i'm willing to scroll and then i would just move on with my life yep me too i'm still a completionist and it's becoming more and more difficult you should you should try to make that part of your new new year's resolution to stop to follow fewer people on twitter to lower the volume i like it no (laughs) just just to skip tweets that don't matter or or we could just all defect to another social network that has fewer people on it in general and then it'll be way easier to be a completionist. Yeah, I haven't I haven't looked at Mastodon in three months. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if anybody has. <laughs> there's there's a solid contingent of folks in Minneapolis and St. Paul. There's actually an, a Minneapolis and St. Paul specific instance that's still going strong. Nice. Yeah, I'm you're a, a part of that, right? Yeah. Are you a maintainer yeah, yeah. or something like that? I don't I'm remember. on the GitHub org. I've helped out a couple times, okay. but I'm not very useful. Yeah. So, I got so. an email from Mastodon with like 25 notifications saying here's what you've missed and it was stuff that i'd seen before but since i was using an a-, a third-party app it didn't know it that didn't i saw register. them so it was like six months of six months of notifications perfect i thought i actually missed something but nope. <laughs> no it's mastodon and ryan what about you for twitter uh no i i followed i followed the bitwarden account but i'm not gonna link it here because it's bitwarden i don't think that's that important uh, i getcha we did a big old password manager roundup on Second Opinion. If you want to go listen to that, Bitwarden was in this there. That's true. And Brandon and I talked up one password like there's no tomorrow. This is true. Um, I'll talk up one password some more if if, if you. You should follow if, that if them want, on Twitter whatever. at one password. Fantastic it Twitter presence. Yeah, definitely the the Twitter account that keeps on giving. Yes. They actually they they liked our. Uh, they ostensibly listened or at least click click the button to see that we had tweeted about them yeah which is pretty adorable they're good kids good kids yeah i um <laughs> i'm not i'm not good at following people i uh i don't want to, i don't know what to say uh that's all right you, maybe in our next episode in let's see march, march. i'll do better <laughs> uh it, it it'll be february okay <laughs> well we will see so, um, what what are you guys doing in the next time before the next episode? Um, well, it is January, which means it's winter, and it is cold out, and there's snow coming, uh, which is very unfortunate. Uh, some of the things I have planned is um, I, I have finished the first set of changes here in the studio. Uh, over the past week, you might have seen some photos go up on the uh, Nixus TV account on Twitter, and those are pictures from the new studio. Uh, and this is the first podcast where I'm talking about that at the end of the show. So I got to bury the lead like as deep as possible. <laughs> uh, Brandon gets it. Um, Truly, indeed, it, good old journalism. <laughs> so 
most of the like the heavy lifting is done of course um the experts in lighting which is um i believe brian um will eventually come over and he'll tell me how many light led light strips to buy and where to put them Ooh, um to I make it you. look cool um and so like that's cool um starting some new projects up at work because it's the new year um going to continue doing hook stuff grid stuff semantic ui stuff which we'll talk about next time um let's see what else uh there's something i'm doing uh the first weekend in february it's um mini mini hack i don't know it's some mini mini something at the u of m do you know what it is yeah. brandon brian did you did you end up doing that one year i thought mini some... a while back uh, no you did one at um carlton yeah uh carl it's... carl hacks i did carl hacks. okay yes. okay i got it so it's funny you mentioned that because mini hack the the one that's at the u this one um that one yeah yeah, yeah. So I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna do that one, but um, somebody who I know through the Minneapolis Junior Devs Group um, is interested in it and is also gonna go there. So um, I've I've heard good things. I know of people who have gone. Um, weirdly, a lot of them ended up working at Sport Engine. Nice. Uh, <laughs> NBC Sports Engine, the engine for sports, formerly known as Sport Engine. Nice. Um, yeah, it's the only way you can say the name now. It's like uh, I don't know. Uh, other things that are like that i get it <laughs> i know yeah, what you're exactly. talking about but i just can't think of an example so i'm not going yeah, yeah. i'm not going to participate in the hackathon part i'm actually going to be there as like a helper person or something hey that's awesome um so i'm doing it through through work so so that'll be fun so if we don't record before then that's what i'll be doing in february how about you uh Let's see i think i'm probably going to continue uh working uh, i'm at a co-working space now uh a couple days a month five or six days a month five days a month actually precisely um and that's been kind of nice it's uh it's good to have a spot to work that is downtown so i don't have to bus all the way back home or bike all the way back home before i'm able to be productive again yep after meeting with folks uh down south so uh that's been pretty solid uh in february i'll probably be tidying up uh one contract and starting on another one we'll see how that works out um other than that just kind of keep on keeping on nice um i will be hopefully giving a lightning talk at javascript minnesota at the end of the month on typescript oh typescript it's just a lightning so short but yeah should be good nice that's really all i have uh going on yeah very cool well um where can we find you all on the internet well you you can find me just about everywhere but especially on the twitter at randomar and of course on my website randomrepreset.com and you can find me uh on twitter where i'm brandon underscore mn uh instagram where i post pictures of all of the loaves of bread and maybe some other food but mostly just bread seriously 80 percent of my life is bread now um and other than that i'll just be around town and brendan's good on instagram he he compiles a few days worth of bread photos into one post so it's not bread 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 every day all day it's yeah it's like a lot of bread every few days and that's that's a good way to go yeah, my my story's a little obnoxious though. Yesterday I was very tired and had a massive headache and ended up sharing lots of pictures of me dis- descaling like my espresso machine and the sink and the espresso machine again. <laughs> a day and in the life. I, That's what stories are all about. Exactly. Yeah, lots of lots of fun silly things on that Instagram story. Um we can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L. Um, or my website, brianm.me. I have a new post about some things just looking back on 2018. Um, also included in there is a link to my one second every day from 2018. So check it out. It's pretty cool. Nice. Uh, well, you can find the uh, show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash pk44. Um, you can discuss the episode on our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. Um, and you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV if you'd like to show your support and get early access to the fringe if that's still going on. I don't know. Yes, that's Talk still going Narbonne. on. Cool. <laughs> well, have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one.
the Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.